Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to thank this guy sitting here. I don't know him, but his name is Murdoch. <laughs> I see him for the last how many decades now. <laughs> kind of related to him, aren't you? <laughs> we have run into each other a few times, of course. Uh, I want to thank everyone coming to this to this talk, and uh, especially members of Central Southwest Asian Studies, Montana World Affairs Council, Chris, Bob, and everybody else contributing to this uh, wonderful gathering that we have. And uh, we have a special guest today <laughs> that uh, somehow uh, because of his service and because of uh, tripling, not doubling, tripling like the, uh, the degrees that he got, including Central Southwest Asian Studies, I asked him uh, to come here and thanking him for his service and also talk to us and um, after, like, we're going to be, like, he said that he needs, like, maybe 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Yeah. That's a good time. Uh, and, uh, and then we take it from there. Uh, we're going to leave maybe you know, five, 10 minutes for questions. And there are microphones on two sides of this case that please uh, use the microphones. Hang on to your question until... We are finished, and then last 10 minutes, you take some questions, and here we go. Uh, we are dealing with Central Asia that nowadays, uh, quite often, they use inner Eurasia, actually, substituting. Now, uh, uh, myth and reality. Uh, now, a couple of things that came up, especially like this wonderful presentation by Jennifer, actor Jennifer Warren, and she was here right before uh, this talk. Uh, I, uh, I thought to add a few things that primarily I think that are very important as far as uh, two, two actually topics. One, uh, on terrorism that primarily we are dealing with awful type of events and incidents uh, we are dealing with just just now, and the other one, the the question of energy. That somehow, uh, let's go forward and talk a little bit about something that came up yesterday, also on the question of this place, Ustape, Ustape project that primarily was brought up during presentation of Army National Guard of Montana was here, we're here yesterday with excellent presentation on Central Asia, Afghanistan. And primarily, if you look at the, the area that somehow we are dealing with the ecological environmental disaster of Oral Sea, the fourth largest actually uh, I, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, lake in the world that primarily has a kind of a story behind it, a short story first, because there were questions coming up that what is the big deal that what you see here, Ustape primarily, is 230 miles already of a river that is taking water from Amudaryo River. This is Amudaryo River that. Uh, uh, the question was, uh, what, why, why is it such a disaster? Well, the thing is that when we are talking about this particular project, it has a lot to do with what happened in the United States. And that is going back a little bit into time. You are talking about second half of 19th century. We are talking about civil war and Russians or Russians or watching we we're talking about Alexander Lord Alexander the the second Lord Alexander the third his son that that is the time that they are ruling from Russia 
And they said, oh my God, it's such a big crisis of cotton. Cotton? Yeah, cotton. You know, last year, Uzbekistan sold $1.93 billion worth of cotton. So you can imagine that when we say cotton, we are not talking about cotton that you see here and there. We are talking about Uzbekistan, massive amount of cotton. Now, where the story goes is that the uh, Alexander II sends uh, as a covert operation people on the shore of Amu Darya River and Sir Darya River. Amu M A M U, Sir Darya S Y R D A R Y A. I said that just guys, just do a little bit of work, see whether uh, this is a good place to cultivate cotton. So the rest of the story goes in the sense that now this area, they turn it, the flatlands of Central Asia, into a gigantic, like Uzbekistan parts of Turkmenistan, this primarily Karakorum uh, Canal that it was made by, it started in 1956 at the time of Khrushchev after Stalin. And this area has 800 miles of canal that take water to these cotton fields. Now, what has happened that less than 5% of water actually gets to Oral Sea? As a result, Oral Sea level has dropped 18 feet. So it has disintegrated to North Oral, East Oral, and West Oral. And as you see, West Oral is almost all gone. But then, vis a vis the fact, that, aha, uh -huh, 1991, the fall of Soviet Union happened. And right away, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, K-Y-R-G-Y-Z, primarily they said that, oh, wow, we have so many rivers, 900 rivers, over 900 rivers, Kyrgyzstan. It's the Switzerland of Central Asia, beautiful. Uh, they said that, okay, we're going to build this 60 some dam on these rivers right away, environmentalists and ecologists said, that, wow, you are, you are going to be destroying this place. And they did. So what they did, they started this hydroelectric power that somehow it provides them huge amount of energy. Talking about energy, one of the topics of this place conference. So for that matter, they use five to 10% of that energy for domestic use, the rest of it, they sell it to China, to India, and elsewhere, whoever asks for it. Now, meanwhile, Tajikistan going through a civil war between extreme left and extreme right. After seven years, they decide, they say, wow, next door, Kyrgyz are somehow making, uh, building these, uh, these dams, you know, like, uh, so uh, we're going to somehow follow that. So we are dealing with 60 some dams. The largest dam in the world actually is built. Uh, on uh, the Vash River that we are looking at here, that primarily is 900 feet tall. And, and they just, last year, they just find enough money to finish up this, this gigantic dam that is half finished. So for that matter, when we are talking about another, another 60 some dams being built by Tajikistan, Look what happens to this water that goes to Uzbekistan. So Uzbekistan, what's going on? You know, Turkmenistan is taking one third of Amu Darya River water. These guys have, each of them are building 60 some dams. So what happens? It's going to be a disaster. You know, Uzbekistan primarily, when we are talking about 2007, Uzbekistan was the first exporter of cotton in the world. So here is the new president of Uzbekistan. When we are talking about a president, uh, right in the middle of those cotton fields, saying that, my God, we have to do something about this. Now, when we are talking that he comes to power in 2016, and since 2003, he is prime minister of President Karimov. 
known as little Stalin. He doesn't listen to anyone. Kind of a, you know. Uh, so this guy is kind of milder, more rational, and uh, say that, well, we have issue with child labor. We have issue with all these chemicals that has contaminated the water, soil, and even air. When we have storm, the dust that goes through the air, it, it has caused problem for people. So we definitely have to reduce now that we don't have water. Like that is why like it's going to be this particular Gush Tape uh, canal or waterway that now they don't know how much how much more of it they're going to be built in 230 miles. Uh, it's going to be raining out another portion of Amu Darya River, and they are telling Afghan, asking Afghan, what is going on? All of a sudden. China is building you a multi-billion dollar artificial river for what purpose? So, oh, we want to cultivate wheat, barley, uh, other type of grain, and we're going to be exporting, uh, exporting them and making money. So, in that sense, so that is where the problem comes from, a little bit of background on the problem. Now they were talking about energy and there was somebody made some sort of a comment that, oh, Saudi Arabia since 19th century or beginning of 20th century are selling a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. Now, William Darcy, another genius. Just like us, we were talking about Zoroastrians and fire temples. And they have fire temples that burn fire for every day, day and night, year after year, decade after decade. So, oh my God, this is amazing. So he goes here. This is called Solomon Throne, this area. It has a temple that they, they, they refer to. They said that this was Temple of Solomon in the Khuzestan province, which is very close to Iraqi border on Iranian side, near Persian Gulf. And he started digging around and then people come and said, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? He said, well, I, I heard this. He said, well, you're gonna get into trouble if you do this. You have to check with the, with the king, with the local uh, like ruler and get his permission in writing. So people don't bother you or you don't be in prison for doing something illegal. So he goes here, uh, borrowing money starting in May 20th, 1901. Uh, officially, actually, he gets that permission. And then already he had been doing some activities and eventually with all the primitive type of uh, tools and devices he had, he hits the first well, as you see here. Now, this is a walking museum we are talking about. And that, uh, that shrine that you see there is just something new. That is Hezbollah, Islamic uh, governor, governor, uh, government that is actually ruling Iran for the last 44 years, have been imprisoned, 85 million people. They have now six to 7,000 of these men. They wear shrines, ancient old shrines, medieval shrines, late ancient shrines. But these are money makers. People come and contribute money to the, to the saints. These are phony saints. They were not, nothing like this here before. So anywhere that they think people visit, they have built one of these six to 7,000 of them. So in that sense, when we are talking now, what does it have to do with terrorism that we are talking about? So uh, this area, fast forward, we are talking about that paper that now Darcy that died in a few years. He enjoyed a little bit of his accomplishment, but that paper falls in the hands of British Petroleum, BP. BP used took 70 some percent, 73, 74% of petroleum from this area 
expanding it, uh, its activity till 1953, fast forwarding it, that there is an uprising nationalization of oil happens at a time of President Truman that his very good friend, uh, Dr. Mossadegh, is kind of a PhD in international law, is prime minister in Iran and said that this is, this is unacceptable. 70% 70, 70 74% of petroleum goes to British. This is, this is belong to people. So he nationalized oil and as a result, now we are dealing with two major American companies, petroleum companies. Who are they? Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of California. They changed their name to Chevron and Exxon. So now we are getting into early 60s, at the time of President Kennedy, 1961-1962. Somebody is coming to visit Shah of Iran. Oh my God, now you have national oil. Wow, you are the first on the line as far as as far as exporting petroleum and oil. This is Malik Faisal, Faisal, F-A-I-S-A-L. The oldest brothers of all these brothers who have become king of Saudi Arabia. I said, I've come to visit my brother that you, you help us developing our oil. This is the beginning of Saudi Arabian oil. So Shah sent quite a few of engineer, technician, laborers who have worked in the field to Saudi Arabia. So when we are talking about Saudi Arabia, oil and, uh, somehow brings friendship to two countries that now they are so antagonistic going after each other. At one point, they were so close. So now, all of a sudden, millions that this family, this old family has, has turned into billions. They don't trust other clan or even their own people. So they said that we really need security for six to 7,000 members of royalty in Saudi Arabia, all the Saud, all the Saud, the Isqa. So where did they get their security from? Hmm, 40,000 Pakistanis, members of armed forces, soldiers. As the safety and security of six to 7,000 members of royalty of Saudi Arabia. Aha. Uh -huh. And they come from Baluchistan, Indus River area called Sand, comes from Punjab in Pakistan. They also come from North, Patan, Pashti. Uh -huh going to Saudi Arabia, getting familiar with the extreme orthodoxy that some of these people follow and bringing books, bringing literature. And we had Mr. Ahmad Rashid. Who is Ahmad Rashid? R-A-S-H-I-D. He wrote the first book on Taliban. Overnight, he sold millions. He was here having presentation. And he said, actually, he wasn't, he wasn't in the ballroom. <laughs> the ballroom was filled. People were sitting on the floor. All the hallways were closed. We came with President Denison. This is 20 years ago. And President said, what's going on? What have you done? So what we just, we just said, Ahmad Rashid, the author of Taliban, is here. So how many? He said, wow, this is, this is dangerous. So Ahmad Rashid said, I was just a humble writer. But then overnight, I have become so famous. And he came for the second time, actually. And he said that, well, Taliban has a split. Now we have Pakistani Taliban and Afghani Taliban. Now, when we were talking about the connection between petroleum oil and terrorism, that was something missed, that much of this was backed up, financed, 
by some of the members, not all, but some of the members who had affiliation with that those members, those soldiers that somehow has committed themselves to Wahhabism, Wahhabism that orthodoxy, extreme orthodoxy of Saudi Arabia. So when we are talking about the extremes, like when we are talking about party of God or Hezbollah in Iran, that they are, they go hand in hand with some of these extremes there. Now, this, this is like primarily uh, what is happening primarily in Israel is definitely backed up by this Hezbollah. But then this was missed as far as the devastation that some of our best, some of our best that one of them is sitting here has fought these guys, these Taliban that in come from uh, some of these things like Waziristan, like there are a couple of North Waziristan, South Waziristan, somehow in Northern Pakistan. We know that they were, they were camps, training camps there at the time of President Clinton, actually, when he bombed, said, oh, what are you doing bombing? He said, well, these are, these are terrorist camps, they are training camps for terrorists. So, uh, but then people did not believe when 9-11 happened or when we are talking about the war that has been going on in Afghanistan, the longest war, the unpopular war, and then thousands of our best lost their life. So uh, the relationship that was missed as far as some of these activities are concerned. But meanwhile, uh, to be, to be or not to be, uh, we have to thank some of the people that we started with President Denison, who actually traveled with us a number of times on the Silk Road to Central Asia and beyond. And President Engstrom, that also was very supportive and, and uh, traveled with us. And President Bodner, that has been very supportive of our program. If you look up, as I, I said, it said that Central Southwest Asia and it says University of Montana, Google it right now. Uh, and primarily, uh, this is like a unit that has not had any sabbatical, has fundraised six, seven million dollars coming, bringing to campus. And uh, you still are doing this. So uh, I wanna thank them all and Now, also, our colleagues that we lost last couple of years, I thought, uh, and they were members of this uh, like uh, committee that run uh, our unit. Professor Green, we are talking about to your, to your left-hand side, the chairman of history department, Professor Baduna from uh, forestry and preservation, some of the best. Professor uh, Linda Fry from History Department and Professor uh, Dietrich uh, from Religious Studies Department, Paul Dietrich. Uh, so, um, again, memory of some of the best that we lost. Oh, an advertisement for my book that just came out, but then we go. <laughs> this is from an editorial review. <laughs> this is a critical work that extends 21st century scholarship of Central Asia broadly and also integrates uh, for the first time a macro analysis of historical archaeology, art history, and an appreciation for cultural pluralism, accomplishments, and significance of inner Eurasian civilization, too long ignored. So they, we, we find out now, I don't know how long, how much time we have to go through this, but then you see, uh, how far we go with whatever is left on these uh, slides. But then uh, 
some other books that somehow, some of my books, some we have done together with other, other international scholars that were part of the project. Just a reminder of some of the accomplishments. Aha, uh -huh. Eurasian step or a step. This is the beginning of time. Now we are looking at some of the ideas, concepts that was somehow brought up to us. And now, uh, although still people use this type of like ideas repeatedly within their, their books or articles, but then much of it has been, has been changed. And part of it is that when we are talking about Central Asia, we have Western step, Eastern step, when we are talking about a step it starts from Manchuria, primarily into Central Asia, all the way into the heart of Europe. So uh, uh, the, the traditional idea or conventional idea was that uh, they talk about Pontic Caspian. Uh, Pontic Caspian, this area primarily between Caspian Sea and Black Sea, that they think that they wear number of migrations actually from this area to North India, to Near East, Middle East, and to Europe. But now, because of when we are looking at, uh, like by call, there was a human, a frozen human from Paleolithic era. era. It's been found within this, this, this uh, Plate. So that brought the question, but well, if by any chance there were migration from here, this guy is much older than, than whoever claimed that the population, somehow population explosion uh, or that migration actually started from Pontic uh, Caspian area. So when we look at the some sort of that, especially by Chinese and Russians. Uh, this is like when we are talking about Pontic Caspian, that primarily from the north of Caspian Sea, Black Sea, but well, Ukrainians today actually, uh, this migration happened to North India, rest of Central Asia, Near East, Middle East, and then Europe. But then they said, about well, this, this is like, is not updated. Here it is what they are dealing with. They think that uh, 67,000 uh, BC is uh, through like from Africa, uh, even older 230,000 BC. Uh, people moved into Near East, Middle East, uh, into Mesopotamia, crossing Central Asia, and uh, all the way here, when we are talking about this, uh, this person that they have found in, in ice. And then somehow the migration toward West happens. So when you talk to some of the Chinese and, and Russian scholars who somehow commit them. So, and there are people that now they believe that, well, it, it to them, make, it makes sense. Somehow they think that somewhere to the south of Caspian, uh, south of uh, Kazakhstan, actually, uh, there was a split. When we are talking about R1A and R1B, these are the, uh, these are like identifying uh, the uh, DNA of uh, some of these people that have been found uh, within these areas. So uh, the, uh, and then, oops. Oh, that's all right. So this uh, migration actually continues. Now, one thing that somehow contributes to this idea is the fact that when we are talking about the Xinjiang area or Eastern part of Central Asia, 
we find this Kohadian that now uh, the Xinjiang uh, Urumqi Museum actually has hundreds of these mummified bodies that they are somewhere 4,000 years old to 2,000 years old. Now, this is the oldest of these mummified bodies known as Beauty of Lulan. This is Church and Man. And uh, these are mostly on the, uh, on the southern section of the Silk Road we are talking about. So Silk Road has not been established yet. But then when we are talking about Lulan, is one of the regional capitals within early ancient times. So uh, these mummified body primarily uh, now uh, they, uh, their DNA uh, are tested. And when we are talking about some of the people that they, re they reside within the area, like Uyghurs, last, last uh, semester we had an Uyghur scholar who had brilliant, excellent presentation for us. And uh, uh, they, uh, they talked about the fact that, well, look at our DNA. Well, we are not Chinese, you know, we don't look like Chinese. And why China primarily has uh, taken over this place and uh, somehow claims that we were part of China since prehistoric time. Uh, so that, that is, we are gonna be addressing that question here. Now, vis-a-vis -vis the fact that actually the oldest writing, European writing that they have found is in Kucha, again, in Xinjiang area. Uh, Kucha is to the north of the Silk Road and uh, Tokharian primarily uh, is the writing that uh, in the uh, Tokyo uh, like National Museum, they have a very large, almost as big as this screen, of Tokharian writing that they have taken from Kucha. So that writing also in a temple or part of a temple palace, they have found it also on the wall. Uh, now, when we are talking about the uh, besides like Tokharian, between 2000 BC to 1150 BC, we have a sophisticated uh, culture called Andronovo culture that primarily in the heart of Eurasia. And from that culture, they think that they are number of these ethnicities like when we are talking about Cimmerian between 1000 BC to 8th 8, 8th century BC, and then Scythians 900 BC to 200 BC, and then Sarmatians primarily uh, that is from 200 BC to 4th century AD actually come from. So uh, when we are dealing with different type of ethnicities, primarily we are talking about clans, clans that are led by a king and a queen, warriors around them, and then herders. Uh, this is the very first place that actually, let's see what, what we have out here. Yeah. Uh, then uh, we are dealing with, uh, with uh, this place that actually, uh, the, uh, uh, the horse is actually domesticated for the first time. Sheep has been domesticated for the first time. And uh, primarily when we are talking about the, uh, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, inventions that we're gonna be looking through uh, comes from these cultures. So two dominating culture, horse culture we are talking about, sheep culture. Of course, there are other animals. They play an important role when we are talking about like uh, goats and, and donkeys and, and camels like, uh, and then uh, yaks in the, in the high ground. But one thing that happens that somehow is uh, uh, disturbing this is one of these, uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, invasions that in, in Silk Road uh, you have taken or you are taking it primarily we talked about Huns or Qianlu that said uh, 3rd century BC to 1st century AD primarily they are pretty much pretty much dominating within, within this area. Now this is the uh, Urumqi Museum in Xinjiang that uh, at times now they have hundreds of these uh, in their freezers like with the uh, uh, with the temperature that somehow 
is always the uh, fixed uh, to uh, uh, to the to the uh, uh, degree that somehow uh, preserves these mummies. And as you see, this mummy is in a kind of a uh, glass refrigerator. Uh, usually, there are like 11, 12 of them displaying in the museum, in the like the, the gallery. But then in the, the warehouses somehow include uh, much more when we are talking about Urumqi Museum. That is a modern museum just built not too long ago, a couple, couple of decades ago. Uh, so that is another evidence that some of the people within the area they said that what are Chinese doing here? So uh, now amongst these people, like uh, when uh, Russians start penetrating from west, they started breaking into these tombs that in Russian known as Kurgan, K-U-R-G-A-N. And then they find sophisticated type of jewelry, especially gold pieces, that have magnificent type of, uh, uh, shows magnificent type of skills as far as, uh, and give us a lot of information about uh, some of these uh, uh, people that testing like a uh, uh, kind of animal skin between two of these Scythians or Sakas, and then uh, horse culture we are talking about. And then this, this uh, particular piece is in Hermitage Museum, in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, Hermitage Museum primarily is like Fort Knox. It has over 20,000 of these gold pieces that mostly are like through excavations that it starts. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Peter the Great, like in uh, 1715, actually, uh, he uh, is moving uh, his capital from Moscow uh, to St. Petersburg and then building a palace there next to the palace is a museum. And within that museum, you find uh, 20,000 pieces of, this is Hermitage Museum. That the second floor of this museum, you have to give your name and then they said, okay, we'll call you. So they have to check. <laughs> and then when you go there every few feet, there is someone with a machine gun. And also somebody says, that, oh, I'm a guy that I'm gonna just walk with you so you can. So they display uh, some of their, maybe 40, 50 of their pieces, but much of it is in the storage room. Uh, but it's kind of, it shows the, the uh, uh, how skillful uh, these people were. They, they were master of metallurgy. Like we are looking at like uh, gold, silver, bronze. Now, when we are talking about uh, metals that play a very important role as far as instruments, tools, armaments, primarily like fourth millennium, we are talking about copper, third millennium, we are talking about bronze, second millennium, we are talking about the steel. And then by, by the year around 1000, steel is carbonated, we are talking about the first steel, actually iron steel that we are dealing with. Uh, so here we are dealing with Scythia that for the first time by the fourth century, it became one unique political entity. Otherwise, when we are talking about Scythians or Saka primarily, they are kind of decentralized type of entity that each segment of it is ruled by a king and a queen. And we are talking about king and queen that they are uh, like we are talking about warrior cultures, actually, uh, like these guys. So this guy uh, was found by a uh, Kazakh uh, archaeologist, Akishov. Akishov is Kamal Akishov, A-K-I-S-H-E-V, 1974. He was walking through the funerary site that there were 40 different kurgans once they were all broken in by grave robbers so accidentally this guy they missed and he was in the wall of one of these that he was hitting the walls and all of a sudden you know, he felt that that wall is like empty inside so he has four thousand pieces of gold woven together now after the fall of soviet union uh, Natalia, Natalia uh, Polozmak, uh, P-O-L-O-M-A-K, uh, 
he was within uh, to the east of um, the uh, Kazakhstan, uh, to the north of the what what, what where Akishov was actually, and he found this uh, queen in in ice. So when we are talking about uh, the uh, some of these uh, kings and queens surrounded by by their uh, uh, by their uh, warriors. Uh, now I I put the uh, Chris Beckwith uh, book called the uh, um, the uh, Empires of the Silk Road. It's on reserve if you like to look at the cover of the of his book. Is this so? Uh, now when we are talking about horse culture, primarily we are talking about domestication of horse 3500 BC. This is like when we are talking about the steppe, that the grassland, that is the perfect place. It's so cold that trees don't grow, but then a lot of grass, and then they are the ideal place for uh, like herding, like we are, we are talking about horse culture, sheep culture. Uh, this is like Tian Shan Mountains we are looking in the background and a lot of sheep when we are talking about sheep culture. Now, Professor Don Beduna, that we saw his, his picture a uh, few slides ago. Uh, uh, the, uh, he actually was visiting and he came to our class and talked a number of times. And he uh, actually uh, was the very first who wrote about how threatening this, uh, uh, this like uh, open grazing is, like when in certain areas, because now uh, privatization has come, the idea of privatization somehow has brought the idea that these people can have more horses, more sheep, or other animals. So some of these areas somehow that grassland have deteriorated, has been badly damaged. So uh, some of these counties started putting restrictions as far as number of like animals or horses, or they have to be in closed area rather than be openly like wandering around. Now, when we are talking about chariot, 2000 BC, chariot was also invented in this area. That number of chariots were, have been found that when we are talking about the heart of Eurasia and then the idea of chariot somehow uh, traveled elsewhere. Now, this is like, uh, there are two cities that they are interacting two warriors. And when we are talking about 900 BC to 200 BC, that's the estimate of this gold piece also in Hermitage Museum. And what you see here, for the first time, we see pants or trousers and then boots. That for the first time, they think that it came here. Actually, when we are talking about Shi Huang Di, one of the statements he makes, he said, guys, with those skirts you are wearing, like." talking to his armed forces. You cannot ride these horses. We are, we are getting stallion horses from Eurasia. So you better wear pants and boots to be able, just like uh, these guys, you'll be able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to be a little bit more comfortable on the horse. Oops. Now, when we, we were talking about Andronovo uh, culture, that uh, uh, in the heart of Central Asia. Now, one area that is uh, significant is Bactero Margiana uh, archeological complex here that uh, somehow uh, some of the uh, archeologists, uh, now this, as, as you see here, this is right on the Silk Road, that Silk Road goes through. This is Tian Shan Mountains. These are Kundun Mountains. When we are talking about Lulan or Chechen, uh, Chechen, they are right here when we were talking about them. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, when we are talking about Altai Mountains, that some of these mummified bodies have been found, 
They are right here, Altai Mountains, north and south. This is Tian Shan, this is Kunlun. So uh, now, uh, Victor Serenini uh, is one archeologist who had done extensive work in this area and thinks that this is one of the, uh, the heart of some of these uh, uh, accomplishments, civilizations, uh, when we are looking at uh, uh, some of the artifacts that have been found. Uh, now, uh, oops. okay, here when we are talking about Yoche or Tokharian, see that it says Tokharian. This is a time that when Xiang Nu, when we are talking about Huns, he started somehow uh, disturbing the area, and these Tokharians start moving south. And then eventually we find them taking refuge from Parthians and eventually by first century, in fact, by the year 30, 32, they established Kushanid Empire to the north of India. And for the first time, they established Buddhism as uh, they convert actually to Buddhism, not enforcing it on anyone. And so when we are talking about 320, for almost like 300 years, uh, they are one of the dominating uh, like uh, ruling party of the ancient world we are talking about. And then primarily we are talking about to the south, uh, like the Parthians that primarily is the collaboration of seven of these clans that have migrated from north, they established another empire and then to the uh to the west we find roman empire remember that when we were talking about silk road we were talking about collaboration of of china uh to the to the east with kushani that are going to be uh somehow establishing between first to third, fourth century and then Parthia and, and roman empire uh, now, when we are talking about city and culture, primarily the domination of this, it's 700 BC to 300 BC, some, some uh, sources say uh, 200 BC. Uh, this is the oldest uh, woven rug, like knotted rug that has been found in Pazirik, in Altai Mountains, that area that to, to the, uh, to the uh, northeast of Eurasia. And when we are looking at Pazirik primarily, Rodenko, one of the archeologists, R-O-D-E-N-K-O, -E -E uh, found uh, primarily uh, like 4,000 pieces of artifacts, uh, gold, silver, uh, like uh, pottery pieces and felt pieces, and especially this particular, uh, this particular rug that has uh, uh, horseback riders and uh, and then reindeer and then abstractions that somehow include uh, in its uh, composition. So here uh, we are dealing with any time that Chinese were actually giving us pictures from Xinjiang. They were showing Tatamakan Desert, uh, saying that scaring off people. Oh, it's a very awful area. Don't go there. You know, you you are gonna die. But we are, we are talking about Tianshan Mountains and uh, beautiful like uh, horse cultures, sheep cultures, and uh, beauty of the area. And now, guess what? Tatamakan Desert has turned green by Chinese. They are cultivating numerous type of food within the area. See if we can get there. Otherwise, we will look at it in the class or when we talk about the new silk road, but uh, see how far we go with that. Uh, so primarily when we are talking about, this is Takamakan Desert actually. Now there was a question that was brought to Jennifer about uh, and Jennifer was talking about the domination of the uh, Royal Dutch, as far as uh, Royal Dutch was the first that put billions of dollars that uh, 
the, the, here uh, there is a there is a, a city, an ancient city called Hutan, uh, that Chinese call it Hutian, uh, K H O T A N, and they dig ten wells, like for petroleum, natural oil. Three of them hit uh, petroleum. One of them ignited. They didn't know how to drill. <laughs> when you drill, there are three layers, gas, and then petroleum, and then salt water. You cannot hit the petroleum, otherwise you have explosion. You have to hit gas or, or salt water. If it's gas, they pipe it. They used to burn it, now they sell it. There's good price for it. Everybody likes to have natural gas. Otherwise, uh, when it hits uh, salt water, they pump salt water into a depression, like causing, creating a lake or pond. And then they put a faucet on top. And then the pressure, gas pressure, whenever you open up the, uh, the, the faucet, you, you have petroleum. So in that sense, uh, the, the satellite picture was saying, there is a gigantic fire in Tacto Johnny said, no, 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 it's your imagination. Don't think about it. And then after a few weeks, he said, can you come and help us? We cannot put it down. So like experts go in to put down the, the gigantic fire that has caused because they hit, they hit petroleum. And now uh, the... Uh, Kashgar also area has uh, resulted in finding some uh, largest, actually, uh, uh, largest uh, natural gas. But then uh, the, the response uh, that they were saying about the, uh, uh, the uh, petroleum natural gas in Central Asia or Middle East, uh, the, well, there was one company that played a very important role shortly after the fall of 1991, an American company who actually went to Kazakhstan. And now they have found largest, there was a, there was a question I actually brought up uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the name of the company, Chevron. Chevron played a very important role as far as what we see in Central Asia. Although Kashagan oil field, that is one of the largest oil fields in the world that is found in the tip of Caspian Sea uh, is one. But then when we are talking about Turkmenistan, this area, that was one of the poorest, one of the 15 states of former Soviet Union, one of the poorest, now is the fourth largest exporter of natural gas. And when we are talking about Turkmenistan here. So, uh, yeah, they, they are, there was question about seven pipelines going from, from Siberia to, uh, to Europe. But then right now, the, uh, uh, the French has actually made uh, a billion dollar contract with UAE, United Arab Emirates. And then the Germans uh, made another contract with uh, Qatar. That is the uh, uh, that a both Persian Gulf entities. So I didn't want to interrupt the presentation, but then uh, there were questions that uh, statements that were important in that sense. Uh, it was... We're not going anywhere. Are you? Do you have a, something that you want to play or you want to talk? I can just talk. Okay, that's a good time, actually. We uh, have till two o'clock. So uh, as long as, uh, however, uh, how long you want to talk, yeah. uh, then uh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be somehow answering a few questions. Mm -hmm. But I would like you to welcome uh, our guest. And Tyler Worm, that as a, a veteran who has served in Afghanistan and now uh, after uh, 
uh, two bachelor degrees. He, he's getting uh, the uh, third one, finishing Central Southwest mm -hmm. Asian Studies. So, First of all, I would like to say thank you to Professor Artie Kia and Meridad Kia for putting on the 20th uh, Central Southwest Asian Conference. This is my fifth one I've attended, and I've never been disappointed. Always some good stuff come out of this place. Um, so... Um, like Dr. Kia said, I'm a, I am a veteran. I spent seven years in the Army when most of that time was with the 101st Airborne. I did two tours to Afghanistan between 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, all on the eastern side of the country where it was predominantly Pashto near the Pakistani border and the Hindu Kush. Um, not the greatest place to be in the winter. Um, but I wouldn't trade my time for anything. The time over there, it was very enlightening. It was a life experience I'll never forget. I um I lost a lot of good friends, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I also gained a better understanding of our cult of the culture that's over there and how very diverse it is. And that was, was, and that's part of what brought me to the Central and Southwest Asian Studies program. And I've been a part of this program since 2017. I have my minor in it. And I'm currently finishing my major in it. And I'm gonna apply for grad school after afterwards hopefully to be working with these two again. And um, I highly recommend this program. You can never go wrong with it. And the professors are great. The coursework's great. I have gotten more out of it than I would have probably anywhere else because there's such a personal touch and aspect to what both Meridad and Artie teach and you just it makes it feel like you you're there and um so it's partially one reason why I'm still a part of this program and want to continue to work with the program and also I've done a lot of research and uh, stuff on Afghanistan and studied it quite a bit. Um, I currently had a paper published in our journal, I think it was volume 10, um, that I wrote for Meridad's class. That was about the Soviet Afghan conflict or the Afghanistan conflict from 1978 to present. And it dealt with the um, it dealt with the communist regime going into Afghanistan to the Soviet Afghan war between 1979 to 89 to the multi to the two civil wars that took place to so the Taliban taking over up to the U.S. going in in 2001 to the time we pulled out. And I did a lot of extensive research on that with help from both professors and I'm continuing to do research on that just because it's an area that fascinates me so well and I'm able to put my own personal touch onto it because I've been in that region and a lot of people that I've talked to when I uh, got out in 2014 and when I was in Billings is where I'm originally from one of the things they asked me is, what is that country like? The best example I can give is it's Montana and North Dakota put together between the Badlands and the Rocky Mountains. That's about as close you can get. And 
I mean, it's a beautiful country. The people are amazing. The food over there, I miss it. You can't go wrong with it. The fresh made bread they'd make every day in their mud ovens. Um, but I mean, I learned so much about a culture I had nothing or no clue about. And I mean, when I went over there, I was 18 years old. I was still wet behind the ears. I didn't know a thing. I'm 34 and I've learned to appreciate our, a culture that is so picked apart and viewed as something terrible. And it's really not. I mean, I've, I have a lot of friends that are Afghani. I have a lot of friends that are Muslim. And they're some of the greatest people I've ever met and came across. Um, it's the idea behind the radicalism that they deal with is what gives that culture a bad name. And you can't just judge an entire culture on something that is that everyone doesn't follow when when the taliban came back in within a matter of when the taliban came back and in, into afghanistan they were already there i mean these guys are ruthless they don't care and there's probably some of the worst fighting i've experienced and um it was these people have no quarter for anything they wanted they were just lying in wait in order for us to pull out and retake the country back and bring it back to a state of sharia law where women are treated like nothing and you know, for 20 years, that even though I was there for two of it, for 20 years, that country experienced freedom. Women were allowed to vote. They were allowed to go to schools, uh, attend universities. Um, it's, we, it seemed, it may seem like we put a lot of work and effort into that place. But we did a lot for those people. The people wanted us there. They wanted our help. And when we pulled out, literally at 4.30 in the morning, without any warning to our allies, it caused a mass panic. And within two weeks, that country reverted back to what it was pre-9-11. And part of me is... A lot, a lot of veterans I've talked to that I'm friends with were angry about that fact because everything we did over there was for nothing. But in reality, what we did over there was for the good. We helped build roads, new schools, put in new uh, water treatment plants to help make that country thrive. But like Meredith said in an earlier panel, that country will never be its own nation state because of how tribal it is over there. And it's such diverse that it's, you can't, the people won't come together as one, but there is one thing that they all want and they want the Taliban gone. So will that happen again who knows i mean it's we don't know what the future we don't know what that future is going to hold over there but the work that we did the friends i've lost the lives thousands of lives that were lost over there it was a slap to the face when we pulled out because we stabilized that region and now it's in an utter state of chaos, plus with what's going on in the Ukraine, what's currently going on in the Middle East. It's everything's just beginning to escalate and it's going to get worse. 
and where we stand that's for our government to decide and what we're going to do but like i said earlier i have no regrets in what i did um i do it again in a heartbeat um i would i would come back and do this program again all over um never thought i'd have a college degree let alone going for three of them so i'm the first in my family to graduate from college i'll be the first to graduate with a, to apply for i'll be the first to go after a grad school pro or a graduate degree and when i do that i want to keep my focus in central and southwest asia to continue to study Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, and that all that region because there's so much that we're still learning about that area. And there's never enough time in the world to understand it all. And thankfully, I've been lucky to work hand in hand with both Meridad and Artie. And they have made my time here at the university amazing. And they're a very vast wealth of knowledge. And I strongly recommend if you haven't taken any classes from either one of them, you do, because you'll get so much out of them. And the information you will retain, and it just carries over into a lot of other classes that you will take here at the university so my time with them has been amazing and i hope those that are taking silk road with Artie or um any of meredith's classes you at least get something out of it i know i did i'm still and if you're not a member of the central and southwest asian studies program you should be it's a great program so but thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of the program. I am grateful to continue to be a part and look forward to working with a lot of you in the future. So thank you.